Arik. Um, Dr. Kirschenbaum is a fellow in natural sciences and a tutor here at, at Girton. He does a lot of teaching and a lot of pastoral care for our students, but he's also a brilliant zoologist. Um, a Cambridge graduate, he has worked in Israel, he has worked um, in the United States, and most recently he has published The Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy. By the way, there are a few copies on sale for £10 in the back of the room uh, for after the talk. Um, and I fear this is what we're going to hear about today. So, Eric, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Is this loud enough, yeah? Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how we can start to talk about alien life in a sensible and in a scientific way Get away from science fiction, get away from conspiracy theories, and, and, and get away from our lack of knowledge, because we're living in a very, very exciting time. We believe that it's very likely that we will discover signs of life outside of our planet probably within the next couple of decades, in the next 20, 30 years. So we need to start thinking as scientists what that means what it means in terms of what kind of life there might be and what it means for our understanding of life in general and how life arises and how, how life evolves. Now, you might think it's really difficult to do any scientific research on something that we've never seen and we don't know about, we don't even know whether it exists. But that's where I want to, that's the point I want to make. We really can say quite a lot about alien life without even having seen it. And that's because from studying life on Earth, we've understood, we've come to understand a lot of fundamental principles about the way that life works. So just like we can say things about distant stars and distant galaxies, because we know laws of physics that we've discovered on Earth apply in space as well, well, the same thing, similar things go for laws of biology. I'll talk a little bit about what those laws of biology are. But first, we live in a very, very rapidly developing age. Uh, 30 years ago, we didn't even know whether there were any other planets around other stars. I and mean, we thought there, there probably were, but we didn't know that. Since then, since the discovery of the first exoplanet, there have been thousands, thousands and thousands of planets discovered far, far from our solar system, and many different kinds. So there, there are rocky planets, there are, there are lava worlds, there are all kinds of different, different planets around in the galaxy. And a recent study estimates that there are somewhere between 11 and 40 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. Not just planets, Earth-like planets. 11 to 40 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. That is a lot of Earth-like planets. And our discoveries that, are, that, that, that we're making are being driven by our technology and, and new technology coming online all the time. So the James Webb Space Telescope, which if, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but first pictures are due to be published next week, is going to be able to peer into the atmospheres of those planets, to look into that tiny layer of gas around each planet and detect what kind of chemicals exist in that atmosphere. So they'll be able to, to say, for instance, whether a particular planet far, far away from our solar system has oxygen in the atmosphere. Or maybe it will have industrial pollutants in the atmosphere. Those kinds of discoveries are well within our reach. We are expecting to see things like this really within the coming years. So that will give us a very good indication of whether we think that life exists or not around other planets. The problem is, of course, that finding oxygen in an atmosphere or something like that might tell us that there's life on a planet. It won't tell us very much about what that life looks like and what it behaves like. And for that, unfortunately, all we have at the moment is science fiction. Now, Science fiction ideas about what aliens are like are driven largely by what the authors think 
they should look like. What would make a good alien? What sounds like a sensible alien? And also, of course, constraints of makeup and, and, and stuff like that and, and how much money you want to spend. The thing that science fiction doesn't think about is why aliens are like that. How did they get to be like that? You can't just make up a, 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 a look or, or a shape or something like that and say, well, I think that's what it should be like. The question is, how did they evolve? And it's the evolution, it's the evolutionary pathway that will tell us about what aliens really look like. So let's go back and think a little bit about, about how life evolved and what's the process by which life came into being, on our planet at least. So life on Earth is extremely old. A life began on Earth not long after the Earth cooled enough for, for liquid water to exist. So very, very old, about 3.8 billion years old. But if you look at this timeline from when life began here, almost the entire 3.8 billion years, about three of those 3.8 billion years, life on Earth was very, very simple. It was basically pond scum. And modern, modern creatures, things that you might recognize as being animals and plants and things like that, really only came into existence somewhere between a half a billion and, and, and a billion years ago. So if we were to discover an alien planet, just sort of pick it randomly at some point in its history, most likely what there will be on that planet is nothing more than, than slime, um, bacterial slime. Now, there's, of course, we, we can't be sure. That we, we could find planets that have complex life and that have, and that have um, uh, more complex animals and, 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 and plants or their equivalents. But it took a long time for the complexity that we see on Earth to arise. And the reason it took a long time is because of the kinds of interactions between those animals. And that's what, that's what I'm going, to, that's what I'm going to, to, to talk about. So my book um, deals with those steps, those steps that life took on the way from being simple to being complex. And what we can understand about those steps and what part of those, of those innovations we can say more about or less about. Things like movement, things like communication, how organisms communicate with each other. These are things that we can, that we can analyze from a scientific perspective without being constrained to, to what's happening on Earth. Now, the starting point for all of this, the starting point for any kind of reasoned argument about what alien life might be like, is the most fundamental thing that we know about complex life, and that is that it must have evolved through natural selection. We know that organisms today are more complex than when life evolved 3.8 billion years ago. If you take a crow, an intelligent crow, and you ask, how did that happen when life began as pond scum? Well, the only way that that complexity can accumulate, the only way that life can get more and more complex to the point where we have humans and, and crows and, and snails and, and trees, the only way that complexity can accumulate is through natural selection. And that's really, that's really the key. We understand natural selection pretty well. In the last 150 years, we've, we've made a lot of discoveries and, and, and have a much deeper understanding of how evolution by natural selection works. And that is a universal process. If complex life exists on other planets, it's there because of natural selection. In fact, if life exists on other planets at all, it's there because of natural selection. Because even the simplest organisms, even those, those bacteria, those very, very simple creatures that were the first creatures that existed on Earth, they are vastly more complex than the soup of chemicals that preceded them. So somehow that soup of chemicals became bacteria. And that also is a process of, of, of natural selection. So by understanding the way that natural selection works, we can understand what's, what's going on in the evolution and the, and the development of complexity and life on, on other planets. But natural selection isn't the only thing 
the only tool that we can use for understanding alien life. Life, in general, is highly constrained, and it's constrained by the laws of physics. So if you think for a moment that you're an animal that wants to move along a solid surface, how are you going to do it? Well, you need to have friction, because otherwise you can't exert a force on, on the ground. But you don't want too much friction, because that slows you down. W legs are the obvious answer. Right? Only be in touch with the, in touch with the ground at a, at, a, at a single point. Legs are incredibly useful. And they've evolved over and over and over again on Earth, not because it's Earth. This is not an Earth invention. It's just because physics says, mechanics says, that's the way to get around. This, um, th oops, this organism here, by the way, that's not a, an, an alien. That's a, a, a reconstruction of, of one of the earliest legged creatures on Earth. If you are moving around, and you know where you're going, then you've got a front and a back. And if you've got a front and a back, you also have a left and a right. And it's an interesting observation that the vast majority of animals on Earth, the vast majority, 99% of the, of the species on Earth, are symmetrical. They've got a left side and a right side. And that arises directly from the fact that they move. It's an efficient way to move. It's nothing to do with life on Earth. It's to do with physics and geometry. So we can expect that any life on other planets that needs to move will have a left side and a right side. And if it needs to move on, on a solid surface, it'll probably have legs. There are other constraints, um, other mechanical constraints on life. Um, Flight is a very interesting one. So we know that flight evolved four times on Earth, in birds and bats uh, and pterosaurs and in insects. And each time it evolved with wings. And they're very different wings. I mean, the, the birds and the bats and the pterosaurs, they're, they're, they're modified arms, but the insects certainly aren't. Why wings? Why always wings? Well, it turns out there aren't that many different ways you can fly, right? Um, there's only three ways you can fly. Uh, there's what's called ballistic flight, which is where you just sort of jump and, f and, and launch yourself into the air, but that's not, very, that's not very efficient. It's not very well controlled. There's buoyant flight. And in fact, buoyant flight is very common if you consider fish to be flying, which most people don't. But, but if you think about it, that is actually what they're doing. They're floating in a fluid and, and, and getting around like that. It's much harder to float in, in a gas, but I'll talk about that in a second. And the third way to fly is with, a, is with an aerofoil, is to generate lift from wings. So, so this is not a coincidence. This is not something to do with Earth, that, that all the forms of flight we have on Earth are with wings. This is just physics. And we could expect flying creatures on other planets to have wings as well. But what about buoyant flight? That introduces a very interesting question. Why aren't there any flying whales? It's not that difficult, right? We understand that if you fill a bag with a light gas like hydrogen or helium, then you'll float up into the air. Well, hydrogen's a very easy gas for, uh, for organisms to generate. You could easily have an animal with a sack on its back filled with hydrogen. It would float up into the air. Why doesn't that happen? And here, the constraint is not a constraint of physics. It's a constraint of ecology. The reason there are no flying whales because there's no food in the air. That, that particles fall out of a, of a gas very quickly. There's no immediate advantage to a whale floating up and, and sailing around the sky. Now, you might say, well, it would be advantageous maybe to get to another ocean or to get to another lake, but that's not how evolution works. There's no foresight in evolution. Everything that evolves has to provide an immediate benefit. And if there's no immediate benefit to going up in the air and looking for looking for flying krill or something like that, then you, won't have, then you won't have flying whales. Ecological constraints really give us an excellent indication of what complex life on other planets will be like. Ecosystems are actually what drive the complexity of life on Earth and on other planets. When we think about... Um, science fiction ecosystems, and, and there, there are science fiction movies that put a lot of effort into thinking what ecosystems are like. This is um, Avatar, the movie Avatar. Um, and you might think, well, you know, they've just sort of like taken Earth creatures and, and, and made them look a little bit alien. And, and 
is that true? Maybe there will be nectar-sucking dinosaurs and, and um, winged apes and, and, and things like that on other planets. How much of this is just projecting our own understanding of, of, of ecosystems and how much of it is realistic? Well, when you think about ecosystems, I mean, you're probably familiar with diagrams like this from school, uh, and you've got different relationships between different kinds of animals and plants. It's important to remember that these animals didn't just sort of drop into a diagram. They all evolved together. All those relationships evolved over time. And it's those relationships between the different organisms that drive the evolution of complexity itself. I'm going to demonstrate that with, a, with a, a, some, some uh, stories from the history of life on Earth. So if we go back right to the earliest life on Earth, um, and what you see on, on the left there is that these are called stromatolites, the modern ones at, at the bottom. And that, that picture at the top is, is one of the, it's a fossil stromatolite. It's one of the oldest fossils of life on Earth. It's about three and a half billion years old. And what these stromatolites are, are basically they're bacteria. They, they, and they live in a in a in a mat. They just and they grow out of the these these um, structures grow out of the of the warm oceans. But all of these unicellular animals are living together in a community. On the right there, you see what we call a bacterial m uh, biofilm. So these are bacteria living in one place, and they're surrounded by this sort of slimy uh, substance that they that they exude, and they're all in a community. They're competing with each other. They're cooperating with each other. They're communicating with each other, using chemicals to send messages what, uh, what nutrients are, are, are in abundance, what nutrients are, are, are in short supply. This is actually a, an interacting community of bacteria. You can't avoid living in a community if there are lots of individuals. And so already, right at the beginning of life on Earth, there were interactions between, between organisms. And it's those interactions that are driving the way that life evolves. About, um, about 600 million years ago, life on Earth might have looked something like this, as an artist's impression um, of this a particular era in, in Earth's history. As you can see, the, the life was fairly simple. Um, some of these organisms are animals. Um, but they're, they're fairly simple animals. They get, all these organisms are getting their food from either from the sun um, or from dead organic material that's, that's, that's um, floating down through the, through the water. But you'll notice that none of them have shells. None of them have teeth. They don't seem to be doing a lot of eating each other. And so it was quite a quiet and, and placid sort of environment. And then about 540 million years ago, suddenly, very, very, very quickly, everything changed. And within a few millions of years, the Earth was transformed. And all of a sudden, you have animals with teeth, and animals with shells, and animals that are burrowing, and animals with eyes. Because they need eyes to see where, where there's something they can eat, and they need eyes to see what's coming to eat them. The moment one animal started taking a bite out of another animal, that, that placid and, and idyllic scene was doomed. Doomed. Because once animals start eating each other, you've got to evolve to protect yourself against being eaten. So very, very rapidly, the world transformed. And it transformed in a couple of interesting ways. Firstly, irreversibly. There's no going back to the Garden of Eden, right? There's no going back. Now that we've got predation and animals are eating other animals, it, it'll, never be, it'll never be the same again. But also, look at the diversity. Look at the increase in diversity. The moment that interactions between animals became more complex, the animals became more complex as well. And the diversity that exists on Earth is driven by that complex set of interactions between the animals. That's why you have some animals that burrow, some animals that have shells, some animals that, that, that swim quickly to, to eat other animals. Predation is inevitable, and it's going to evolve eventually on every planet. 
It's just because energy is at a premium, and if you can get your energy by stealing it from someone else, you will. Now, once you have predation, um, interesting things happen. Obviously, you don't want to be eaten, so you evolve defenses against predation. But the predator wants to eat you, so the predator evolves to be more ferocious and stronger and larger. And this goes, this goes on and on, and you can get arms races evolving. And eventually, you get to ridiculous situations where you have um, predators that are, that are huge and ferocious and with, and with huge teeth and prey that, that have great big horns and, 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 and so on. This is also not an Earth-based phenomenon. Okay? This, is the, this is what you can expect as soon as you have these complex interactions between complex organisms. Arms races, uh, ferocious predators, and well-defended prey, these will exist on other planets as well. Now, if we go back to our, um, our ecosystem diagram, you'll see that a lot of these interactions that we see in ordinary life on Earth, these are, these are inevitable interactions. As long as we have life of some sort, then we're going to have organisms feeding on it. And as long as we have simple organisms, we will have predators that are taking advantage of them. And then we'll have organisms that are defending themselves against the predators, and then organisms that are large enough and ferocious enough to overcome those defenses. This pattern of interactions is almost inevitable. Almost inevitable, given enough time. Now, there's one important point that sort of culminates all of this, which is that these arms races, they're inevitable, but they're incredibly wasteful. So y y just look at that triceratops, right? Can you imagine carrying these huge horns and, and, and all of this uh, armor, it's, it, it's not really the, the most efficient way to protect yourself against, against predation. What else can be done? What else can you do to protect yourself against predators? Remember, in, in evolutionary terms, if there's an opportunity to exploit a niche, it'll probably get exploited sooner or later. What other opportunities are there? There is another opportunity which is very common on Earth and is almost inevitable to evolve on other planets as well. And that's living in groups. Living in groups is tremendously beneficial. It has all kinds of benefits. You can defend your territory against other animals. You can find food better. You might cooperate to be able to find food resources. You can protect yourselves against predators by, by calling an alarm call and then warning all of, your, all of your colleagues. You can cooperate to solve complex problems, perhaps complex building problems, perhaps building a, a communal defense or a nest or a warren or something like that. You can cooperate to look after the young, to raise the young. Very, it, it really, living in groups is, it has, has a, lot of, a lot of beneficial elements to it. It's group living's evolved many, many times on Earth, and we can absolutely expect it to evolve on other planets as well. But if you look at that last picture, that reminds us that group living is actually quite difficult. Well, I think we all know that. Living in a, in a society this brings with it a lot of problems. There are a lot of interactions with other individuals that need to be managed. You need to remember who your friends are. You need to remember who your enemies are. You need to remember who your friends' enemies are. And it gets really quite, quite complicated. And intelligence, social intelligence in particular, goes hand in hand with the evolution of societies. All of these animals that live in groups have to have the ability to manage relationships, to understand relationships, to know how to, who to rely on and who to exploit. And that requires considerable intelligence. It requires communication as well. And there needs to be a complex communication between those individuals. So I think you can see where I'm going with this, which is that step by step, starting from the bacterial slime, 
the series of events, the series of evolutionary events that led to the world that we know today and the existence of humans that we have today, none of those steps were particularly unusual or particularly specific to planet Earth. I'm not saying humans are inevitable, but they're certainly not an exceptional evolutionary pathway, given enough time. I mean, it's taken three and a half billion years for, for humans, 3.8 billion years for humans to, to evolve on Earth. We don't know if that's very fast or very slow. We only have one example, so we can't really tell. We do know that most planets, Earth is a relatively young planet, so there are a lot of older planets around in the galaxy. So sort of summing up what we can say about what alien life is going to be like. Well, the first thing we can say is that all life needs energy. We know this. This, this, is, this is essential for life because life exists out of equilibrium with the rest of the world. So it needs energy to maintain that equilibrium. On Earth, most energy for life comes from the sun. And that's a really reasonable place to get energy. And most planets will have plenty of sunlight. Um, it's not the only place to get energy. And there are planets, for instance, with, with underground oceans where sunlight wouldn't be a, an option. And there are other sources of energy there from from the, the heat of the planet's core and, and other places where, where you could get energy from. But on, on planets that have a solid surface, um, then light from their star is probably what's driving life. So some form of photosynthesis will be the first, the first form of life. I said that predation is inevitable. It is inevitable. Even before that dramatic transformation that occurred 540 million years ago, um, there were organisms eating other organisms, all right? Those stromatolites, those, those bacterial mats were grazed by, by other bacteria, by unicellular organisms that were just sort of amoeba-like things that would crawl around on top of them and, 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 and eat them. So, so taking your energy from other organisms is absolutely inevitable. It's going to happen on any planet. Once you have predation, there is a clear advantage to being able to move and to move effectively and to move quickly so that you don't get eaten. And that's going to lead to the evolution of symmetry and if you're moving on a solid surface of legs. Now, of course, not all organisms on Earth move to avoid predation. Plants don't. They just sit there and they put up with it. But it's easy for plants because they get all their energy from, from, from the sun anyway. That's an interesting discussion about why plants don't move, but uh, we could talk about that later if you like. In any case, we can expect at least some organisms on other planets to be symmetrical, moving, and probably with legs as well. One thing that I haven't talked about, I haven't had time to talk about because it's a huge subject, um, is sex. Can we expect some form of sexual reproduction to exist on other planets? This is a favorite theme of science fiction authors. Uh, that's not the sense in which I mean it. Um, but there are reasons to think that some form of sexual reproduction probably is necessary for the complexity of life that we see on Earth. Um, but that's a, huge, uh, that's a hugely contentious topic. That's why I haven't really introduced it. But it's... It's likely, and, and I, put that, I put that here because of, of the next one. I said that group living is essential. But group living, we can also call family living. And that's because organisms that live in a group, are m whatever happens, whether there's sex and parents and children or, or, or not, organisms that live in a group are more likely to be related to each other than they are to organisms that are not in their group. Just from sort of uh, spatial considerations. So you could call that a family. And once you have organisms that are more related to each other than they are to other organisms, then they cooperate more. And that's just one of the laws of natural selection. Once you have families, 
once you have groups that are cooperating, then you need that social intelligence, you need that social communication. And sooner or later, that intelligence and that social communication will evolve into language, will evolve into technology, and the rest, as they say, as they say is history. So, I hope that I've, I've imparted to you, so, or at least convinced you a little bit, that understanding what alien life is going to be like is not impossible, but basing it on, on what we understand about life on Earth, what we understand about evolution and how evolution works, we can make some pretty good, some pretty good guesses about what we're going to find in the 20, 30, 50, 100 years to come. So, thank you very much, and I've left plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a raw microphone, and I already see a question here. Thank you. You made the basic assumption that people accept that life has evolved through natural selection. But when you look around, and unfortunately we're looking at America, you start to see that a large section of the population there is encouraged not to believe in natural selection. I thought this was absolutely fascinating talk, but I think while you are looking there, some of your colleagues have got to be increasing the education that people do understand the basics. Otherwise, heaven knows where, <laughs> heaven knows where we're going. And, and we even had a situation, perhaps we'd better not bring Northern Ireland into this, where the leader of one political party was apparently a 4004 BC believer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so there's two dimensions to that. One is how do you deal with um, people who, who, who genuinely don't believe in, in natural selection and don't believe in, in, in the age of, of the Earth and the universe? And the other is, is a much more difficult question of why am I so certain that life evolved through natural selection? Um, so, and I address this to some extent in, in my book as best I can. It's actually quite difficult. But... There are a couple of things about natural selection that, that make it very compelling. I mean, one is that we, there, is no other, there, there is no other mechanism that we know about, except, and here's where the, the young Earth people are correct, except that life could have been engineered by another intelligence. It's possible. Um, of course, we still need to explain where that other intelligence came from. So we've got to come back to, to natural selection at some point. But there are plenty of, of, um, uh, of biologists and, and, and astrobiologists who think that when we discover life in the universe, what we will discover is artificial life, life that has been created by some other civilization. Well, perhaps, but, but that doesn't explain where, where the other civilization came from. But the key thing about natural selection that I think a lot of people who, who that a lot of creationists don't understand is that natural selection isn't optional. It's actually, it, it's actually necessary. In other words, given a certain set of circumstances, natural, the operation of natural selection is a mathematical certainty. So you can't, you, you can't, obviously you can't say for sure whether this is the cause of the, the complexity that we have, but we know that given uh, organisms that reproduce, that pass on their, their, their traits to their offspring, that have variation and that have differential fitness, so some are more fit than others, in that situation you will get natural selection. You get it with organisms, with life, you get it with computer programs, you get it with internet memes. You know, it, it's just a mathematical process um, that, that will take place. I'm going right back to the beginning of your talk, searching for oxygen. Now, there are rare examples on Earth of organisms that don't need oxygen. Um, so are you looking for anything else in other planets where you could have a completely non-oxygen-based um, 
yeah. fauna or flora. <laughs> yes, and, and indeed, the first life on Earth didn't use oxygen. Um, no, the thing about oxygen, the reason that, that uh, people want to look for oxygen is that it's a very reactive chemical. So if you were to find a planet with lots of oxygen in its atmosphere, that wouldn't really make sense. It would be like, wh why is there all that oxygen in the atmosphere? Because you'd expect it to react with the rocks and, and to disappear. So, so what we're looking for really is situations that look like they're out of equilibrium, look like they shouldn't be there. Um, if you remember a, a, year, and a year or so ago, uh, people claimed they had discovered this phosphine gas on Venus. Now, we don't really know whether phosphine gas is a product of, of life. The, the point is, it, we didn't expect it to be there. Um, and it couldn't be explained by sort of ge uh, geochemical reactions. So, so it's really looking for those out of equilibrium situations. As far as life and oxygen goes, there are good reasons to think that, that oxygen is very useful for life. It's, it, because it's so reactive, it's a good way of carrying energy from one place to another, and that's what life needs to do. Um, but you're quite right. There's certainly other, other things that, that I think people are just looking for anything that looks unusual. Um, really interesting talk. Um, I'm slightly worried that I came in late, so I may have missed some of it. But um, how, I mean, are you saying that alien life somewhere else in the universe is very likely? Um, and um, if so, why haven't they arrived yet? So, right, so, so one of the early slides was um, f up to 40 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. So if you're going to play a numbers game, it's very difficult because we don't know the probability of life arising, but there certainly were, there's certainly a lot of places in, in the galaxy, just in our galaxy, where it could arise. Uh, not so long ago, there was a lot of debate over how likely that step of non-life to life was. So how likely is it that, a, that a, a, a pond full of chemicals could become alive? And a lot of people thought that was very unlikely, extremely unlikely. It's become a huge field. I mean, there are a lot of research labs, including several here in Cambridge, that are looking into this now and investigating new ways in which you could get a transition from non-life to life. There's a new research institute in Cambridge. Uh, Lever Hume um, has funded this, this great big research group in Cambridge. And we're finding that there are probably more ways that that could happen than we thought previously. So going from non-life to life is probably less unlikely than, than we used to think. Um, why haven't we seen why haven't aliens come here? Well, one answer, again, is, is just it's been 3.8 billion years since life evolved on Earth, and it's been 100 years since we could send signals into space. So, you know, do, do, do the calculation. The vast, vast majority of these, these worlds out there will not have technological life forms on them. But, but some of them might be well ahead. I mean, who says Earth started? That's true, that's true, and Earth is, Earth is a relatively young planet, but just to give you the numbers, right, so Earth is, so life has been here for just under 4 billion years, the universe is only 14 billion years, right, and, and Earth-like planets could only evolve as a second gen from second generation stars, so, so we can't be that far behind, <laughs> there just hasn't been that much time in the universe. I wonder if you could just briefly talk about sexual selection. I, I know that Charles Darwin thought that sexual selection was a very, very important part of, uh, of how, of evolution. Yes, so to talk about sex. Um, so here's the thing. If you look at organisms on Earth that reproduce asexually, they're all very simple. And if you look at all complex life on Earth, it all reproduces sexually. Now, that is not to say, by any means, that you have to have sexual reproduction for complexity. But it does indicate 
together with, with other things, we understand how, how things work. It does indicate there's something going on there. When you have sex, what happens is that your children are not exactly like you. I mean, that's the key thing. If we're going to define sex and in an in alien sense, we're not talking about anything mechanical. We're not talking about which bits go with which bits. We're talking about your children aren't exactly like you. You're mixing up your genes or your whatever the equivalent of genes is with, with some other organisms, and so your, your children are not exactly like you. That does seem to be absolutely essential for complexity. Now, what sexual selection showed us was rather like the, the um, food web diagram that I put up, is it gives this opportunity for many, many, many more interactions between individuals that, that are driving new traits and new characteristics. So your peacock tail and the bird feathers and the songs of, the, of, of different animals that, that, that for attracting mates. These are new characteristics that have arisen because of that, of that sexual selection of that, of the, the, the pressure to, to reproduce, that, that you, you need to reproduce more. So really, it's, sex is doing two things. It's shuffling up the her heritable information so children aren't exactly like their parents, and that gives more variation. And it's opening up new avenues for interactions, which, again, are driving, are driving more diversity, more diversity of traits. I think we have time for one final question, I'm afraid. Thank you. You haven't said anything about the possibility of silicon-based life forms as opposed to carbon-based life forms. Have you any views on that? Well, one of the things that I do um, is I try and ignore the chemistry completely. Um, because whatever basis life is, it, it, on whatever basis life is built, the evolutionary arguments will still be the same. Now, Having said that, uh, and, you know, and there's a lot of argument about different biochemistries. Must it be carbon? Must it be using similar sorts of, of, of chemicals to, to what we have? There's a couple of things to say about that. Firstly, no one really believes in silicon-based life um, because chemically it's just, it doesn't really work out. Okay? Silicon compounds are, are either too stable or too unstable. But there's another thing that, that, that people forget about, which is that carbon is really, really, really common in, in the universe. Carbon compounds and water are incredibly common, complex, complex carbon chemicals. So if you go to asteroids, you know, and, and to comets and things like that, you'll find these chemicals and comets are like all made of water. So, so again, it's not something special about Earth. These are, these are chemicals that we know exist, and they form, and, the, and, and, and they combine in, in, in many different situations. Um, so people are investigating novel biochemistries. We don't, we're not saying that life is based on DNA, necessarily. Um, but it does seem that carbon is common, and it has those chemical characteristics that would support complex chemistries. So, so yeah, we're pretty, much, we're pretty much fixed on carbon. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder that Eric's book is at the back of the room just for £10. Um, we are cash only, I'm afraid. But uh, before wishing you a pleasant remainder of your day, I think if you have been fascinated like me by this talk, just we should give him a big round of applause. And thank you very much. Thank you.